Architecture Codex. If you want to see more, like, comment, share, and most importantly, subscribe. Louis Kahn was already a famous architect when the Reformed Jewish Congregation of Temple Bethel of Northern Westchester engaged him to design their synagogue in 1966. It opened in 1972 after a number of years of struggle. Kahn's renowned stubbornness in sticking to his vision and some apparent miscommunications regarding the budget soured the relationship, and it appears the building was finished without Kahn's involvement. One member of the building committee liked to brag years later that he told Louis Kahn what structural system to use, or so he presumes. They patched things up, but this uneasy process and the changes may be why this building is hardly ever listed among Louis Kahn's work. Louis Kahn did attend the dedication of Temple Bethel and admitted publicly that there were times he wanted to wring the neck of the chairman of the building committee. But he also admitted that trying to stick to the budget made it an even greater building, and in the end, it was a good project. Things occasionally go bad in the relationship between an architect and client, and sometimes it's a personality thing and just can't be avoided. So I'm not looking for blame here. In the documentary My Architect, Ian Pei explains how when he might have a disagreement with a client, he might sort of take a step back and let things happen and maybe later come back and get his way or sometimes let it go completely. But he admitted that Louis Kahn could not do that, that Louis Kahn would always push things through and he would confront his client and argue with his client in order to get his way. So it's understandable that a lot of clients may have been frustrated with Louis Kahn as their architect. Kahn! Temple Bethel is technically a synagogue, not a temple. It is the only synagogue, the only significant Jewish building that Louis Kahn designed that got built. Designs for the Herva Synagogue in Jerusalem, for example, were never realized. Funds were lacking and it was perceived as too political, too much of a statement of Jewish presence so close to the Dome of the Rock Mosque, which was built on the destroyed Jewish Temple of Jerusalem. Synagogues go back to when Greece dominated the world and serve a very different purpose than a temple. Actually, the word synagogue is Greek for assembly. Temples, including the Hebrew Temple of Jerusalem, were places of animal sacrifice, and families would go in small groups to present the offerings and have the priest make the sacrifice. For Judaism, there was only one place on earth where such a sacrifice could be made. Since the time of Moses, it was at the tent, the tabernacle holding the Ark of the Covenant. Since Solomon's time, it was the Temple of Jerusalem, which held the Ark. The temple was destroyed by the Babylonians and rebuilt, but destroyed again by the Romans in the year 70 of the Common Era. This was also the destruction of the Levitical priesthood and threw Judaism into a major crisis. But prior to the destruction of the temple, there had already arisen a weekly Sabbath observation in the local synagogues, the local assembly. And it was the reading of the Word of God, the Torah, and the discussion regarding the meaning and the teaching among those assembled chosen people of God. So when the temple was destroyed, the synagogues throughout the diaspora became the backbone of a new kind of Judaism one based on rabbinical teaching and not on priestly sacrifice. At this time, there was also an emerging Jewish sect that would later be called the Christians, and they used the same weekly observances because they considered themselves Jews. The basis of the Catholic liturgy, which is also used by other Christian faiths, is composed of two parts. There's the Liturgy of the Word, which is based on the weekly Sabbath observation in the synagogue, in which the Word of God is read and pondered, and the Liturgy of the Eucharist, which is based on the Seder meal as reinstituted by Jesus at his Last Supper. Neither Christian churches nor synagogues are limited in their architecture style 
by any religious dogma. And we have seen them evolve over eons as culture and technology has changed. The most important aspect in both being the assembly of the people of faith together in one space. Christians and Jews alike use buildings created for observing Sabbath for other ceremonies such as weddings, bar or bat mitzvahs, confirmations, etc. Or of course, major feasts such as Yom Kippur or Easter. And many modern synagogues have education rooms and social space for the celebrations after the ceremonies. But there is no unique synagogue prototype or style. They would build to blend in. Sometimes they have even purchased old Christian churches and repurposed them. And in some ways, I wonder if blending in was done in the hope that if we don't stand out as different, maybe you will just let us be. Because the core of the synagogue, in Yiddish the shul, or in Hebrew the Beit Knesset, because the core is the assembly listening to the Sabbath reading, the Torah, the act of reading becomes central and is usually the visual focus. There is an ark that holds the Torah and there is the bima, the platform from which the Torah is read. Judaism's origins were an oral tradition, spoken word, memorized, and the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the Torah, was only written down perhaps in the 7th or 6th century before the Common Era, perhaps some 600 years after Moses and likely 1,000 years after Abraham. Recall that the ancient Hebrews were nomads and so their religion was not into the things that were part of idol worship. It would not be practical to carry around a stone god or a gold god on your camel caravan. So instead they emphasized the word of God. This is, of course, significant when you consider their most important prayer, the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. Hearing, listening, or Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. I apologize again for trying to speak a language other than English especially when you consider that all the Hebrew I learned was in my Catholic boys' high school. Louis Kahn was born a Jew in Estonia, but as an adult was not observant, and admits to not knowing much about any religion. From what I have seen, he applied the natural spiritual sense that each of us has to an esoteric and philosophical understanding of architecture. After his epiphany in Europe at the age of 50, he found that spiritual center. For example, he would anthropomorphize building materials, saying things like, when you design in brick, you must ask the brick what it wants, and the brick wants an arch, or concrete wants to be granite, but can't quite manage. He also said, in a theater, the stage and the audience are a violin, and the theater around it is the violin case. And so his charming metaphysical ways of talking about architecture made him a hero to the design world, particularly among academics. As a student, I had a professor criticize my undulating brick design by invoking his name, telling me, how dare you try to do something like that? Even Louis Kahn admitted it took a lifetime for him to understand the brick. Well, I was not going to apologize for being 21 and certainly not apologize for my personal exploration about the limits of architecture. So my appropriate, albeit snarky, response was, maybe he's a slow learner. Turns out he was. But my disrespect was not geared towards Mr. Khan, rather to the professor who was more interested in turning me into one of her disciples rather than into an architect. At Temple Bethel, then, Khan created a simple wooden building, presumably inspired by the wood synagogues of Eastern Europe destroyed through the various pogroms and holocausts. The octagon shape of the building is similar to many of these synagogues with octagon shaped sanctuaries. But Khan never expressed that out loud. Light, loft, and craft, my theories on what makes transcendent space, of course, appears in use here. Since the main assembly room is surrounded by other functions, on most days, the light comes from above, from heaven, in the clear story windows, in a square shaft emerging from the top of the octagon, and capped by a pitched roof, creating an even greater loft. 
Craft is not expressed with statues or other art, as no graven image is permitted, even in the most reformed congregations. But since craft, in transcendent architecture, tells the story, that is done with the Torah itself. It is handwritten in precise ways and housed in the tabernacle ark, indicating the importance of the Word of God. And central to all synagogue spaces is the podium on the bima from which the Torah is read and songs are sung by the cantor. Khan's building is wood on four concrete columns and a concrete base, a departure from his heavy masonry style he normally employed. Perhaps this departure was at the core of any disagreement. In 2014, the building expanded to increase the amount of education and social space and the spaces for people during the High Holy Days. The congregation had grown from about 600 people to over 2,000. The award-winning design by architect Alexander Gorlin preserves the form and dignity of Khan's building, separating the new spaces from the original with a delicate and transparent steel and glass entry. The bulk of the addition employs the same wood vertical sheathing, making the addition balance and blend, but it stays lower than Khan's clear story. It is an addition worthy of Khan's original building. Khan came from extreme poverty, learning to draw with the charcoal of burnt matchsticks and twigs. A childhood accident burned his face. Nothing was easy for him. In America, the family moved 17 times in two years and eventually changed the name to Khan. Louis' talents were apparent, and he made money for the family selling drawings and playing piano for silent movies. He turned down a full scholarship to an art school and took on menial jobs because he wanted to be an architect, eventually getting his degree from the University of Pennsylvania in 1924. But his career did not take off until 25 years later, after a stay at the Academy of Rome in 1951. Rome will do that to you. In his travels to the temples of Egypt and Greece and castles in Scotland, he found inspiration. And he came back with an appreciation of monumentality, often rejected by modernists as too politically oppressive. Louis Kahn eventually taught at Yale and the University of Pennsylvania and was awarded the AIA Gold Medal in 1971, among many other honors. He might best be known for the repetitive and bold Salk Institute in La Jolla, California, and the complex an earthy National Assembly building in Dhaka, Bangladesh, completed after his death in 1974. After his death, things that he kept hidden were revealed, including his financial troubles and his bigamy. But to keep things in perspective, Khan does not come off as exceptionally mean or cruel. Rather, he just seemed kind of laxed, falling into relationships without considering the consequences. And perhaps he was so driven to do architecture that he just didn't care about other people's feelings. Khan came to the general public's attention in the 2003 movie, My Architect, A Son's Journey, the documentary made by his son, Nathaniel, one of Khan's three children, sired with three different women. The documentary is an excellent way to see the man behind the buildings, how an architect might view the world. Nathaniel felt that his father was obsessed with architecture only, and the people in his life were incidental, even if he cared about them. But that was always from a distance. In the documentary, Philip Johnson said Louis Kahn was friendly and charming, and not arrogant like Wright, reclusive like Mies, or mean like Le Corbusier. Kahn's associates were willing to forgive his driven attitudes, his occasional outbursts and berating of them, because they felt they were working with greatness. Some even observed his maltreatment of the women in his life, but simply overlooked it. Anne Ting summed up her disappointment by acknowledging that Khan was not meant for the domestic life. He was at home, only at work, in his studio. I generally do not dawdle on the personal lives of the architects, but Louis Kahn's son, Nathaniel, and the movie are now as much a part of his legacy as his buildings. And the movie raises the very important question that can you be a great architect 
without being completely self-centered. Can you believe that you're so great and wonderful that you can build a world and not also believe that that means these social rules do not apply to you even if they hurt the people you profess to love? Is it fair to burden those people with tolerating your greatness? For me, it was an old question. In architecture school, having read about many such egocentric architects, I set my goal to be a great architect while also being a good man. You can talk to my family, friends, and clients to see if I've achieved either. But I empathize with how easy it is to become obsessed with architecture or any creative endeavor. When struck with inspiration, you become compelled to manifest the idea before you die or worse, someone does it first. Everything else becomes an obstacle to that. The stuff that you gotta do before you get to the stuff that you gotta do. And it's easy to render human relationships to a second tier. My wife can tell you many stories of how when she would walk into my studio, instead of getting the polite hello or hi, she gets the what. And so while I might be called to the studio, in pursuit of uninterrupted brain time to develop an idea, to create a building, to make a video, to write a book, to perfect a cartoon, to draw a picture, or maybe someday to paint one, I have to remember that people come first. Life balance is what we call it these days. And that no matter what I might create, it will never be as meaningful as being a good parent, or a good husband, or a good friend, or a good relative those human relationships that God actually calls us to develop. For that then, I must be empathetic to other people, kind, loving. I must understand their needs. I must listen to them. All so that I can be, you know, a human being in addition to being an architect. I'm Michael Molinelli, and this is Architecture Codex.